Hi everybody, I'm Tenley Thompson. And I'm Tyler Greenlee. And welcome to this month's Wildlife Wednesday Monthly Roundup. We've got some great videos to show you from all over the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So let's go ahead and get started and take a look at Laura and bighorn sheep. Woohoo! Oh hey guys, this is Laura. I'm here with you today to tell you about the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. We often see sheep in the winter on our tours in Jackson Hole. Uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep are quite large. Uh, in December, things get really heated, really exciting with the bighorn sheep because it is their mating season. They have a shorter gestation period than most other hoofed mammals at about six months. So these guys mate in December and then give birth to their lambs in the springtime. A lamb is just a baby sheep. Uh, a male is known as a ram who may weigh in around 500 pounds. A uh, female is a ewe, and she's a little smaller. She might weigh in up to about 200, 250 pounds. Uh, the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep is the, the largest of the, the three subspecies of bighorn in North America. Uh, we also have the desert bighorn sheep in the desert southwest, and the Sierra Nevada uh, bighorn sheep in, the Cal in California. Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and other wild sheep, such as the doll sheep or stone sheep, came over the Bering Land Bridge about 750,000 years ago during the Pleistocene era. Their common ancestor was the snow sheep over in Siberia. Now we think that the bighorn and <laughs> the thin horn sheep diverged from these ancestral snow sheep about 600,000 years back. So they went off to do their own thing on a new continent. During mating season, rams will uh, court or guard or tend females. This is a really fun time to watch bighorn sheep get into battles with each other. Sometimes they'll hit each other at about 20, 25 miles per hour with uh, up to about 800 to 900 pounds of force. <laughs> That's some serious fight. Uh, during the rut, during the mating time, you may see rams flaring their upper lip, and, and that's to expose their Jacobson organ and trigger what's known as the Flemin response to a, a female in estrus. Uh, she's going to put out a, like a, a chemical scent to display to her ram whether or not she's ready to breed. But in the meantime, these rams might kind of like follow the ewes around just to be in the right place at the right time. But in the meantime, the rams might battle to <laughs> earn the interest or earn the, <laughs> the mating privilege with that ewe. <laughs> these rams are able to bash their heads together over and over and over again for weeks on end without any malefacts. Another animal I can think of in the wild that does this are woodpeckers who are just bashing their heads over and over and over into a tree without any seeming effects. <laughs> With the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, they're able to actually slow the return of blood flow from their head to their body, creating what's known as a bubble wrap effect, basically creating a, a pad or a helmet around their brain. Uh, they have hollow horn cores attached to their respiratory system, which allows the sheep to rebreathe its own air to increase carbon dioxide into their bloodstream. And that ex expands their intracranial um, pressure, their vascular tree, which creates that nice bubble wrap around their brain. <laughs> So that's how they can just continuously go at it and not suffer a concussion like you would see in a, a human football player. <laughs> you know, maybe football players or training coaches should take a cue from the bighorn sheep and figure out how that would be possible in young athletes. <laughs> I think the life expectancy for a ram, even though these guys look ancient, is only about you know, eight to 10 years. Ewes might live a little bit longer because they're, they're not fighting so hard during this mating season. They might have more opportunity to remember to eat. 
things like rabbit brush or other browse, um, while these males are just so preoccupied with that mating season. You know, other things that can you know, get a bighorn sheep uh, would be like predators, things like mountain lions, gray wolves, grizzly bears, <laughs> bobcats, even golden eagles. Their flying predator, the golden eagle, might swoop in and uh, pick up a lamb in its talons and fly off with it back to the nest to eat a meal. They also sometimes succumb to falling off of cliffs. You know, they think that they're really sure hooved. <laughs> they do have a well-adapted hoof for better grip on the rocks, but that doesn't mean that one day they might not get a little full of themselves and accidentally fall off. Um, up there in the mountains, they could also succumb to <laughs> landslide events or avalanches. Human presence is a deterrent a lot of the time for bighorn sheep. That's why certain areas in Jackson Hole, like up in the Teton Mountain Range, may be closed to skiers over winter just to allow some of our wintering sheep to relax and you know, get the nutrients that they need to survive. We don't want to be chasing those sheep off of their, their important winter range. Uh, bighorn are really vulnerable to diseases, uh, some of the European livestock diseases, like something called microplasm ovinomoniae, which is kind of like sheep pneumonia, uh, and also uh, parasites like scabies, which could uh, ruin their insulating winter coat. Um, <laughs> fire suppression, which reduces visibility for sheep because of dense, tall timber. Uh, that can increase the predation on bighorn sheep, uh, as well as habitat loss in general and, and drought. So <laughs> bighorn sheep definitely face a lot of challenges. Uh, historically, we had about 2 million of these, these animals across North America. Um, in 1960, there were only about 16,000 of them left, and they've made a slight recovery to about 70,000 sheep today. So they're doing a little bit better, but they're, they're definitely a species that we should be concerned about. Maybe take, take steps to make sure they're protected where they can still live in the wild. Well, thanks guys. I hope you enjoyed our, our little <laughs> snippet about Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep. We'll see you next month on Wildlife Wednesday. Bye. Thank you, Laura, so much for sharing that awesome information about bighorn sheep. It was really cool um, seeing those bighorn sheep in December, actually chasing those females all over uh, the butte and all over the mountainside um, in, I mean, great action. You see the rams ramming each other like mid-chase and stuff. Really, really great um, stuff to see on tour. So we often talk a lot about animals with our program, and I thought it would be really cool to change things up a little bit and talk a little bit about the human history in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so we threw together a video talking about the Native Americans that uh, call and used to call Jackson Hole home. After crossing the now submerged land bridge between Siberia and Alaska, Paleo-Americans arrived in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. They cross following herds of big game, some of which still live in Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks today. This includes familiar species like elk and bison. Evidence shows these people arrived in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem around 11,000 years ago after the glaciers covering Yellowstone receded. Since that time, many different people have existed and used this ecosystem, most very seasonally. The associated tribes of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem include 27 different groups of people that have historical connections to the land and resources of this region. In Grand Teton National Park, one of the most prevalent groups of people were the Shoshone, who inhabited Jackson Hole for thousands of years before white settlers arrived in the valley. For them, Grand Teton was their summer home. They followed vast herds of elk and bison on their migration routes up the Grovant River from the region now known as Sublet County. They also utilized over 120 different plant species in Grand Teton National Park for food and medicine. The Tetons and surrounding mountains have always had significant spiritual value to these people and they continue to do so for those living on the Wind River and Fort Hall reservations. 
All right. Thanks very much, Tyler, for that look at some of our first peoples in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I did want to um, play a video that we actually premiered in December for you all again, because we are in the middle of our um, winter wildlife multi-day programs, both our six day and our nine day programs throughout Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. And we do have some last minute cancellations. There's just a couple spots left on some of these upcoming ones coming up here in February. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in uh, jumping on one of these programs, do give us a call right away. Yes. It should be a really, really fun wolf breeding season to learn a little bit more about that offering. Uh, we've got a little video for you here. Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks in the winter are like nowhere else on earth. Join us this winter on an unforgettable journey into the depths of true wilderness on a multi-day adventure with Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures. Our eight-day winter in Wonderland and six-day wolves and wildlife programs will take you on an epic journey to see wildlife as you've never seen it before. Journey by snow coach into the depths of America's first national park, Yellowstone, to see its marvels dressed in snow, and then get an opportunity to see the wildlife that make it famous. Both opportunities will have a chance to see wolves and go in depth with the experts who study them. Get a chance to learn from researchers as you see wolves in the Lamar Valley, home to the densest population in the world. Our trips focus on viewing wolves in the deepest part of their breeding season to give you the best chance to see them in the wild in one of the wildest places on earth. To a witness an eruption of Old Faithful in the silence and stillness of winter is like no other experience. See Yellowstone when it's quiet and calm on our winter wonderland adventure with no crowds and walk through the geyser basins with an experienced guide who can show you the geothermal marvels that make this place so special. Spend a night amongst the geysers and travel to the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone to see spectacular waterfalls. Then travel down into Grand Teton National Park for great opportunities to see moose, elk, bison, river otters, and much, much more. When you go with Eco Tour Adventures, you go with the pros. Our trained naturalists and biologists know the best places to go to see the most wildlife, and our four x four vehicles and snow coaches will get you into the wild in comfort and safety. Each participant will have high quality optics and spotting scopes, and our pros know the perfect places for perfect photography opportunities. We hope you will join us in the wild this winter. Programs run throughout January and February. So give us a call or check out our website for more information on starting your adventure into Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks this winter. All right, guys. Now, we work really hard in this program to mostly provide educational content. We're not here to advertise it, you guys. But I did want to let you guys know about that last minute winter opportunity. There's nothing quite like getting up into Yellowstone National Park via snow coach in the winter to see all the great wildlife, including, of course, opportunities for wolf viewing. If you want to know more, you can definitely go to our website. Kelsey, who's moderating our comment section, will be happy to put that up for us. A little bit more information on those winter multi-days and call our office because we definitely have oh gosh Tyler you're going to be up on some of those programs since I am. Tyler's I'm one of our so excited yeah resident I'm wolf so experts excited. I'm a little jealous he gets to go up and I'll I'll be down here in Jackson for all of you who are coming down here um but yeah we've got like what two weeks um until happens. yeah until yeah. those go off so if you're interested definitely let us know ASAP we've got some room on those snow coaches have to book most of our accommodations and snow coaches almost a year in advance on these programs they are mm -hmm. definitely sold out so it's a great opportunity to get to Yellowstone this winter all right 
enough of that. Um, it's almost time for my um, second favorite part of this program, which is trivia, uh, which Tyler's got a good one for us today. A little but, bit of a different one today. Yeah, I was a little stumped mm -hmm. actually in the beginning uh, when I read it earlier. And then it is time for our favorite part of the program, which is Ask a Naturalist segment. If you've got a question for um, Tyler or I about the natural world or the greater Western ecosystem or Gosh, anything under the sun, wildlife, weather, what have you, questions for all ages. If you've got somebody who's on mm -hmm. the younger side watching this with you and they've got questions or on the older side and they've got questions, we definitely are here to answer those. But before the trivia, we have to have our sponsored item as part of trivia, um, which is our really nifty uh, Eco Tour Adventures coffee mugs. Now the winner of trivia is going to get a gift card to our Eco Tour Adventures store. Um, and it would be something that you could certainly buy one of these on. The art on these mugs is really cool. It's local artist Nicole Gayton. Um, she's pretty darn awesome. And uh, if you're interested in one of those, we even brought one along for the broadcast. You could see that really wicked I'll model cool bear. It for you guys. <laughs> Special thanks to Nicole Gayton uh, for her awesome, awesome artwork. I use this mug every day, and in some ways, I think it's a little too well insulated. Like my coffee's still hot at 5 p.m. Um, so <laughs> if that's of interest, definitely check that out. We always, of course, want to encourage all of our um, folks just to enjoy these programs. But if you've liked a particular guide you've seen during the broadcast today and you want to uh, contribute directly to them and their benefits, um, our web store definitely does have a little tip page as well. Um, some of you guys over the years have asked for one of those. Um, so we definitely want to make sure it's available. Don't feel pressured. Um, but I'm sure that guide will certainly enjoy that. So, okay, without further ado, uh, trivia. Trivia. All right, guys. So this week we have, or this month we have something a little different. We're going to talk a little bit more about plants. Uh, plants, you know, when we think about the wintry landscape, we don't often think about how do plants survive. We're often thinking about how animals survive out there. And so this week's trivia question is, what adaptations do plants have in order to survive the winter. And then you can choose from A, B, C, and D, and E there. Um, definitely a little bit of a trickier question than what we usually have. Um, and then, so give your best answer. And then this is the bonus question uh, for this month. What adaptations do coniferous plants, plants with needles, so like evergreens, have in order to survive the winter? And so definitely give your best shot for those answers in the comment section, let us know what you think they are. I'm really curious to hear from you guys and really excited to talk about plants next month. You know, yeah. we'll talk a little bit about how plants, how our trees, our wildflowers actually survive here in Grand Teton when it's going to be, I mean, negative 17 tonight. How do plants survive through in that? In that kind of weather, for sure. Yeah. So we will randomly choose amongst the correct answers. Um, if, if we try to sort of do two questions, one that's a little easier, one that's a little harder mm -hmm. for each one you get correct is one entry into our, um, drawing for our web store. So if you would like to win, go ahead and comment in the comments section. And, um, there's lots of many other really fun, cool, exciting things. So Kelsey's put a link up there for you to check out, um, local art, all sorts of local, um, wildlife books, some mm -hmm. of some really cool recently published wildlife books about the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, some really beautiful photo books and, and more. So very, very cool. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. And then guys, <laughs> it's time for my favorite part of the program, which is Stump Tenley. No, I'm kidding. I, I've got Tyler to back me up now, so you can't stump me. Uh, well, you stump me, but you probably can't stump him. Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, ask our naturalist segment. So I will tell you, Tyler is recently returned from the Yellowstone uh, winter wolf study. So if mm -hmm. you've got questions about that, he's probably definitely going to have some answers there. Um, if, if we had lots of questions last month about elk and national elk refuge and things like that. So if you felt like I didn't get to all of those topics, definitely that's a great one. Yeah. Um, but what we're going to do is we have our little iPad here. Um, and we're going to answer them live. So if you see us looking down, it's because we're actually looking at your questions live. Bear with us. We'll go from the beginning and then we'll kind of make our way down. And then Kelsey's going to do a great job sort of paying attention to make sure I don't miss any. Um, so yeah, let's see what we've got Sweet. here. All righty. All right. Okay. This is a really good comment. It was from the Bighorn Sheep segment. 
Um, yeah, don't let them lick your car. It makes them sick. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of different states, they actually salt roads, and bighorn sheep are drawn naturally to salt licks. Oftentimes, on their migration routes, the bighorn sheep will end up in an area, often at the base of a cliff, where there is access to salt and other minerals. Because bighorn sheep often live in really dry, deserty conditions or up in the alpine tundra, they don't have access to nutrients mm -hmm. throughout most of the year. And so they often travel to salt licks mm -hmm. and it actually increases their immunity to certain diseases like pneumonia. Um, unfortunately, what that means for the elk in and around Grand Teton National Park is that they are drawn to roads. Yeah. Because elk and big road salt. Yeah. Um, I actually saw a moose on tour <gasps> a, a week car. ago yeah. licking some cars parked in a parking lot. So yeah. um, all, all of our herbivores are definitely drawn to the to the salt. They like salt kind of like domestic horses and cows. Yeah. And Same sheep. kind of idea. But the yeah, difference yeah. is the salt on your car, although we don't use too much salt on our roadways, we mostly mm -hmm. use sand, but it, that sand has minerals in it, including essential minerals that um, both elk and sheep and even moose will yeah. crave, particularly selenium is a big one. Um, you know, we have essential vitamins and minerals that we all need to survive. Mm -hmm. And most mammals need about the same. Um, one of the things we as humans need is selenium. Some of the things that we, um, we need that are essential, we can create ourselves. Yeah. Sunlight, you know, vitamin D, for instance. Mm -hmm. Some of it we have to, uh, we have to eat in order to get. And selenium. Vitamin C. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vitamin C is a perfect example. Selenium is actually pretty rare in the natural world in the Rocky Mountains. So, our bighorn sheep are really lucky on the National Elk Refuge. There is a selenium deposit there that they make heavy use of. But I suspect that the minerals in the sand that they're putting on the roads also probably have yeah. some of those trace minerals, including probably selenium, and that's a big draw. So there's mm -hmm. plenty of other things on your car that are not good for them to be licking and ingesting, you know, antifreeze, spilled windshield wiper fluid, gasoline, things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, not uh, so good. <laughs> you know, we don't need to go on and on, but you can imagine why the Elk Refuge and Grand Teton National Park Ask folk not to let them lick your cars, as cute as it is. And then definitely be careful. If you happen to come visit our region, just be careful driving through the mountainous sections because sometimes mountain goats and bighorn sheep will come down to the road and will actually be on the highway. Uh, fortunately, our bighorn sheep are not on a major highway, but there are some mountain goat and bighorn sheep populations that yeah. cross freeways, cross main highways, and will sometimes be on the side of the road licking salt. So definitely be careful when driving yeah. through those mountain zones in Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, yeah. particularly. Uh, mm -hmm. Fun random fact, since we're talking about animals getting attracted to human uh, issues, mountain goats are actually attracted to human yeah. urine. <laughs> so people who are hiking up in the high country... Um, in the summertime, they'll, you know, mm -hmm. go off on the side of the trail to take a little bit of a rest <laughs> stop and they'll be very surprised when a mountain goat gets way up in their business, um, because there are trace minerals that we're eliminating that are really important for mountain goats. So that can always be a bit of a shocker it's for folks. terrifying. I, I will admit I have this weird fear of mountain goats because of that. Yeah. When I was a kid in high, in high school and middle school, I spent a lot of time in the women wilderness in Colorado and the mountain goats will literally, they're like stalking you, like hoping that you're going to like <laughs> pee on the side of the trail. And it's terrifying. So now that I'm an adult, I have this like innate fear of mountain, mountain goats, goats, but not like, not like any of the carnivores. Like I don't worry about mountain lions when I go hiking, oh, but, that's really funny. but mountain goats like kind of freak me out. Well, and uh, Kelsey, who's our moderator, uh, one of our guides, Kelsey, uh, who's moderating the comment section, she's got some great mountain goat stories oh my too gosh, in that yeah. regard so um <laughs> seriously though guys just random all sorts of ins and outs right but uh, let's see here. we'll go to the next question we've probably gone on and on on this one um do immature eagles ever return to the nest they were hatched into to make their brooding nest when they mature uh mm. rose the short answer is they can um bald eagles kind of do one of two different things i've noticed as, as do ospreys they do uh, they do like to use the same nest over and over again if it's available. Um, and so hopefully if you were born into a certain nest, it wouldn't be available because your yeah. parents were still using it. Um, but they are opportunists. And if there is an abandoned nest that's available, that's a nice option, particularly if their nest is no longer available. And one thing that I've kind of learned, uh, you know, I went to Colorado State University and did raptor surveys. And one thing I learned when doing those raptor surveys is that bald eagles and a lot of birds of prey will have a territory. And within their territory, they'll have multiple nesting options. So they might 
occupy and maintain two or three nests and then choose from those nests which one they want to nest in. Now, those three nests, even if, if they have three nests and two of them are unoccupied, they're still going to try and prevent other eagles from taking those nests because it takes a huge amount of energy oh, to actually build those nests. Ah. And they're defending a territory with limited food resources. And so it's in their best interest mm, to guard a territory with multiple nests. It also makes sense if one of the nests gets damaged. Sometimes these nests get so heavy, they'll actually fall out of the tree, they'll break branches. Yeah. Then the eagles have a next option to go to and they don't have to spend a huge amount of energy trying to build a nest before the summer is over. Yeah. And so they do tend to have several nests. I, If a pair disappears, let's say you know, one of the mates die, then the offspring could absolutely come in and reoccupy that nest that they were born in. Yeah. Very cool. Um, fun little trivia fact. If you go to Artist Point in Yellowstone National Park, there actually is a nest across the canyon that is larger than a Volkswagen Beetle. It's been in continuous use for <laughs> over 100 years, a uh, bald eagle nest. So they can get really, really get big. Massive. Can you imagine a nest the size of a Volkswagen Beetle? That's crazy. Yeah, like when I say breaking branches, I mean like, huge branches <laughs> in these cottonwoods. I'm not talking about like little twigs and stuff. I'm talking like huge yeah. cottonwood branches. Which is like, crazy to me. I had a favorite nest that I used with guests many, for many, many years because we always had baby eagles in it and it got hit by lightning. Oh gosh. <laughs> and when I say got hit by lightning, this was a monster tree, just completely split, split the tree in half. And the eagles, of course, returned for the spring. And I think we're quite disappointed. They did find another tree nearby and we're very happy. But it was like around a corner. It got really hard to see it. Oh. So they had more peace and quiet. They didn't have me coming and looking at them with a spotting scope every other day. If, um, you, if you guys want to see an eagle's nest mm -hmm. without, you know, traveling to go and see an eagle's nest, maybe you live in an area where there aren't eagles, you can always go to like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology mm -hmm. and they have live webcams on eagle's nests. Yeah. And you can watch kind of the dynamics of the pair we're in a lot of places we're getting close to the eagle nesting season a lot of eagles are paired up we're seeing this on tour where they're, they'll sit on the fence right next to each other and especially in the southern states they're going to start defending territories and kind of work on their nests in preparation for the breeding season yeah. so if you kind of want to see that action definitely look up Cornell Lab of Ornithology yeah. webcams for eagles and other birds of prey. Yeah, if you have a favorite eagle or osprey or mm -hmm. uh, nest cam, share it in the comment section. Let's yeah. share the love. <laughs> um, I know there's a couple good ones all over the country, and they're always so much fun to mm -hmm. watch for sure. They also do uh, red-tailed hawks, peregrine falcons, and great horned owls. Yeah. The owls are super entertaining. Um, they're so vocal with each other. They'll actually have duets. So really cool to check out. Yeah, very yeah. cool. Um, I loved this comment. I just wanted to, we do love our jobs. You can't tell. We definitely love our jobs. So thank you for noticing. That's super fun. Um, come on, we get to be animal nerds all day. What's better than that? Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Don, you had a good question. Are you surprised the wolf debate is still as strong as it was in the beginning? Don, the short answer I'd give you, and I'd be interested in Tyler's thoughts on, on this too, mm -hmm. is nope. Not even slightly. If you, we've talked about this a little bit in the program before, but if you think of the controversy over wolves in the Western United States as a surrogate for a completely different issue, then it kind of sometimes makes a little bit more sense. Um, sometimes what people are fighting about and frustrated about and pro and con about is, is actually wolves. But oftentimes what they're really frustrated about, believe it or not, is states' rights versus federal rights. Yeah. And the role of the federal government versus the state government um, in our democracy. And they're using wolves as sort of a way to express their opinions on that matter. So if you keep in mind that the Endangered Species Act is a federal act, um, animals are owned by the state in which they live. Uh, most people don't know that, but if you think about it, it's a little strange, but wild animals have to be owned by somebody because somebody has to be their legal guardian in the court system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the Endangered Species Act, uh, you know, actually removes ownership and property from the states and gives it to the mm -hmm. federal government. Um, if you think about it from a purely legal perspective, that's actually technically what it's doing. And the idea is, of course, that the current guardian hasn't been suitable, either because of no fault of their own. Sometimes the animals become endangered despite a state's best efforts. They just don't yeah. have always the money or funding to uh, try to recover the species. Or because um, nobody has been looking out after that animal, um, and then therefore the federal government is gonna try and recover the species. 
wolves, of course, were expatriated in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Western United States. Um, that's made expatriated is just a fancy word. It means made locally extinct. We still mm -hmm. had wolves in um, you know, Canada and some of those other places, but they weren't in the continental United States. When we reintroduced wolves, we did, the federal government reintroduced them into Yellowstone National Park. And they did this against the will of the neighboring states. Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming were not in support of wolf reintroduction. And um, easy to look in hindsight, and hindsight's 2020, um, and I was quite young when this happened. Uh, but certainly educating an entire generation of people about the importance of wolves, you know, wolves complete ecosystems. We didn't have a complete ecosystem without them present, but just like any animal, there's good things and there's bad things about it. Um, and sometimes they can have impacts on human agriculture and human use of the land. There's no question of that. Um, preparing the states for the eventual return of a species that was feared and misunderstood in the Western yeah. United States probably would have been a really good idea. But what the federal government kind of did anyway is they just kind of bulldozed in and they just said, well, we're doing this whether you like it or not. And so it became a way to express um, that states should have stronger rights and a stronger uh, ability to control their own destiny and their own borders. And that things like the Endangered Species Act, uh, you know, from the perspective of these states weren't fair to them. Um, regardless of where you fall in that debate, right? Things are controversial, not because one side's right and the other side's wrong, but because both sides have how they feel is a valid point of view. And the truth is probably in the middle, like many things. Um, if you don't think of wolves and, and uh, the reintroduction of wolves as a issue about wolves, and you think about it as an issue of politics, then no, I'm not surprised at all that the wolf debate is still going strong because in some ways it's not about wolves. And we certainly haven't settled in this country, um, you know, how we manage uh, state power versus federal power. And that's something that certainly is very, very controversial in the Western United States. There's many, many Western states that feel, uh, you know, definitely that, you know, the federal government should have less power and they should have more. And then there's other states who feel the other way. So, uh, yeah, you know, let's already take something that people fear that they grew up listening to their grandfather tell them stories about rightly or wrongly. And then let's go ahead and um, sort of drop it down on a group of people who already were really um, frustrated about the federal government. And it becomes sort of a, a way to sort of prove that the federal government has done them wrong. So I don't know if that's the sort of the best way to explain it. The reality of the situation is, is there are times when wolves have gone in and depredated on cattle. There are times when wolves have gone in and created uh, problems of all sorts and kinds. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but they are an incredible benefit to the overall ecosystem. They are really, really, really valuable to have in the natural world and having a balance, having people who've lived on the landscape for generations, being able to continue their way of life and being able to have wilderness uh, and be able to protect and treasure that wilderness in an intact capacity is possible. It just requires everybody to meet in the middle. So hopefully Absolutely. that answers that. You have any thoughts? I agree. Um, I'm not surprised <laughs> that it hasn't changed at all. Uh, you know, my home state right now is in Colorado is currently in the process of uh, a wolf reintroduction. And so in a, in a couple of years, they're supposed to be reintroduced. We already have a pack there. And the past couple of months, it's been really rough because these wolves have depredated on cattle. And so, you know, I get all sorts of people on tour, people who are pro-wolf and anti-wolf. And when having these sort of conversations, it's, I think, really important to realize that everyone has a different point of view and that arriving somewhere in the middle and not, you know, being harsh to people because they experience things from a, from a different point of view is, I think, always important. And people have valid reasons why they like or dislike wolves. And so I think walking that middle ground and hearing what people have to say is really important. And if, I mean, if I was a rancher and wolves were coming into, into my ranch and killing cattle, I'd be very worried. Yeah. Um, it is, is definitely something to be, for them to be concerned of. Um, and, and that's, you know, coming from someone who absolutely loves wolves. Yeah. I mean, it's really cool to show people wolves on tour, but the reality is, is that we have to compromise yeah. when it comes to the wolf issue. Um, 
Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. There we go. Hopefully that (laughs) answered that question. Um, Definitely a super complicated one. You know, our goals, as always, are not to inflict our opinion on you so much as to give you the facts (laughs) and let you generate your own opinion. And we get a little opinionated on that one. I try not to, but yeah, uh, great one for sure. Uh, Dan says, explain how the elk refuge works, the benefit of it and why it's important. Oh, cool. So we talked about this This quite a lot last month. (laughs) Um, so we went into it actually a lot last month. So first of all, what's the difference between a national park and a national refuge? I think that's probably important to start with. Um, Mm -hmm. national parks are in the department of the interior, Uh, And national refuges are part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is in the Department of the Interior. So they certainly are run by the same secretary, uh, but their purposes are vastly, vastly different. So the National Parks, the original founding act of the National Park Service, of of course, Yellowstone was our first national park, is for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people for now and future generations. And we won't get into right now how benefit and enjoyment are two very different things and make it very difficult for the Park Service to complete its mission. But national refuges are not for people. There are only federal land and there are only protected land class that has nothing to do with people. They're purely for wildlife. They're for the best interest of what would be best for wildlife first and people second. It's a really, really unique thing. The National Elk Refuge is there for elk first. And for wildlife first, um, and any kind of use by people second, uh, which is a really, really unique thing. It does mean that most national refuges are closed to public entry. because You can't even enter at all. You can't go in them. Or for like very limited times. Mm -hmm. It's not in the best interest of wildlife in most cases for us to wander around the landscape. They they do better uh, when we're not there. That's not to say, you know, you can't go enjoy recreation in the national forest. That's just fine. But it's cool to be able to have a piece of land that is purely for the use of wildlife. And the National Elk Refuge is one of the first land animal refuges created in the United States. We created some offshore islands for birds with you know, rocky outcroppings for nesting. Well, that was kind of worthless land. What's unique about the Elk Refuge is that was arable land. That was yeah. land that had value that we gave to wildlife, which is a really, really big turning point in our history as a country and the conservation movement. So, um, You know, the elk refuge is important because our elk no longer migrate outside the valley. So historically, they probably migrated uh, down the Snake River Canyon, down the Hoback, into the southern southern and southeastern areas of Wyoming, where we get less snow. That migration route was blocked by early settlement, uh, and today the elk are stuck. They can't get any further south. And so um, without dedicated land that's free of cattle, you know, eating all the grass that they rely on all winter, they would surely starve and yeah. die. Uh, and they have. Historically, yeah. when we cut off those migra- migration routes, thousands and thousands of elk actually perished on those migration yeah. routes when they got stuck by development. Um, this is something that I've read about recently because I find it particularly fascinating. Sublet County, which probably not a people not, not a lot of people know about, it's really this this almost barren landscape, and no one really visits there. That's where Pinedale and Rock Springs is probably historically had one of the highest concentrations of wintering wildlife. It's uh, where the pronghorn, you know, we talk a lot about pronghorn on our program. Pronghorn migrate on the path of the pronghorn from the refuge and from Grand Teton National Park to Sublette County. And the elk used to do that yeah. also. And there's historical accounts of herds of 20,000 plus elk in like the 1870s coming down from the gross or from the Grovant mountains onto uh, the upper green, green river Valley and green or upper green river drainage basin. Um, Really, really fascinating. But of course, because of settlement, those animals don't migrate there anymore. And so they come to the refuge, which uh, I think we're pretty lucky for. Yeah, we certainly are. Mm -hmm. Um, If you want to learn more about this, there's like a whole eight minute video on the purpose of the refuge and its history from last month. So check out the January uh, Wildlife Wednesday. If you just go on our page and you go to videos and then you go to live, every one of our Wildlife Wednesdays from the last, what, two and a half years or whatever it is, since the beginning of the pandemic, Mm -hmm. um, is there. And there's a really nice uh, segment with lots of historical photos on that. So check that out. (laughs) Um, I will tell you, I recently was reading the Bison and Elk Management Plan for the National Elk Refuge, which is very dry reading. Yes. Uh, Don't really (laughs) recommend it. (laughs) There was some really wonderful research that was done by researchers as they were trying to decide the future of the National Elk Refuge and how Mm -hmm. to best manage the wildlife there. And they were talking about bison who over the years have migrated out of Grand Teton National Park, un- unknown, nobody saw them do it, and then all of a sudden appeared in Sublette County. 
Um, so if you can imagine gigantic bull bison stealthily moving through the darkness, through like the town of Jackson and neighborhoods, making their way down the busy Snake River Canyon, so and then just cool. randomly showing up in Sublette County. The first couple times this happened, they were trying to figure out like, you know, did someone escape or something? Was it an exotic from a zoo? And no, these were wild animals still continuing on this traditional migration route that probably existed for thousands of years, if not longer, mm -hmm. before human settlement, um, European human settlement of Jackson Hole uh, made that sort of migration mostly impossible. But every once in a while, there was one in like 1977 so cool. who got almost so cool. down to like the state line. It's unbelievable. And you can imagine that, you know, uh, 60 million bison migrating vast distances across the landscape. Of course, they migrated through those areas. You know, we think of mountain, uh, bison as being mountain animals, but of course they were, you know, thundering yeah. across the plains, Nebraska and, you know, Iowa and all these places. And so they still every once in a while are wily and they'll get to these sort of surprising places. So kind of neat. Um, One see. of the reasons I love working here is because we still have a lot of the animals that existed across most of the United States, yeah. like elk and bison, used to exist almost continuously from California all the way to the East Coast um, before they were hunted uh, or extirpated from most of the regions uh, that they used to occupy. Or grizzly and so, bears, right? Grizzly bears and wolves. And so it's really cool that we have an intact ecosystem. We have all the animals that used to live or that lived here yeah. prior to European settlement. Pretty so cool. it's we really think of, cool. We think of grizzly bears as a mountain animal. They were a plains species, yeah. right? That's so weird to me that they were just wandering around the Great Plains where we now grow corn. Uh, just yeah. grizzly bears. Just <laughs> you landscape. can kind of see that though because black bears you always see in the forest, but grizzly bears you often see in like open meadows yeah. and fields and stuff. And you're like, oh yeah, you're a grassland animal. <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> You're bizarre. out here digging up roots in the grassland yeah. in the meadows. That's so funny. It's so cool. Um, all right, let's see here. What do we got next here? Oh, Kelsey's got a good one. She says, one of my best mountain goat stories, they kicked rocks down on me while I was climbing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. More, I mean, fear of mountain goats. Oh, my gosh. For those of you guys who don't know Kelsey, who's moderating her comment section, she's quite the climber. So when she says when I was climbing, she wasn't just like strolling up a mountain. She was like climbing. A cliff. Uh, yeah, and I can't imagine boulders coming down on me from a pesky mountain goat. I mean, how do you tell them to move, right? So that's pretty crazy, Kelsey. Let's see here. All right, we're scrolling down here. Oh, great question. Libby, what happened with the bear-proof trash cans and did it get passed? Short answer, nope. Long answer, they're studying it. So they are planning on passing a wildlife feeding ordinance, and that would include... Mm -hmm. Um, some degree of bear-proof trash cans over a certain degree that's not currently covered. So for all of y'all who don't cover uh, local small town jacks and politics to the same degree <laughs> as we do, uh, we had some grizzly bears that were literally walking downtown this fall. Uh, we also had some problems with folks who were feeding grizzly bears, mm -hmm. and we don't have a local ordinance um, that specifically prohibits feeding as long as the intent is to feed like moose or elk, which is legal mm -hmm. in the state of Wyoming. So um, the woman, for instance, who was feeding grizzly bears and was um, partially responsible for some of this food addiction of some of these grizzly bears who later got euthanized, uh, she claimed she was trying to feed the moose. And so the federal government, despite grizzly bears being anything. an endangered species, couldn't press charges because mm -hmm. there was no local ordinance. So there's been great hue and cry to enact local ordinances that would both create um, bear resistant trash can ordinances where they don't currently exist in Teton County, but also um, keep wildlife feeding prohibited in most varieties. But they wanted to be very careful with the language, is my understanding. Yes. They were worried mm -hmm. that if they just said you can't feed wildlife, that it would mean like you couldn't feed birds at a bird fear. Um, we have some common sense rules in certain areas of Teton County that do work that I'd love to see enacted throughout the county. So like for instance, in Teton Village, you are required to have a bear proof or bear resistant trash container. And if you want to feed birds, the bird feeder has to be, I can't remember, it's like 18 feet up or something. Yeah. I can't remember, mm -hmm. and like six feet out. So it's too far out for a bear to reach because of course they love bird seed. Climb um, trees and reach out and get it. Yeah, yeah, you know, certain types of wildlife feeding uh, are socially permissible I, you know feeding birds whether you decide to do it or not do it is something a lot of people enjoy to enjoy doing and just passing a norm that said you can't feed wildlife no way no how probably would keep people from doing that uh and so they wanted to be careful 
uh, in how they pass these ordinances. There are other people who like to put salt licks out for um, ungulates like elk and moose in the winter. Regardless of how I feel about that, uh, people are gonna have salt licks out for their cattle and horses. And if elk come up and start licking at that, are they in violation? Yeah. Uh, so there's some questions that need to be addressed in that regard. There's enough um, impetus that I feel confident that we will get some sort of ordinance passed. How comprehensive and aggressive it's going to be, we'll see. My hope was that something it would get passed while everybody was really uptight and clamoring for it. Um, taking a deep breath and thinking it through might take some of the... Um, the pressure uh, off of them to really do something aggressive, which is what I personally would like to see. Remember I told you I wasn't going to inflict my opinions. Well, I just did. Uh, that said, it, we are getting there. I think we're going to get somewhere. Uh, funny story, though. Uh, there are no bear truth trash cans available in the United States right now. You just can't get one. They are sold out. Uh, and uh, when I last made an inquiry on this in late October, they said it might be February, March before they were available regardless. So even if we passed an ordinance, it's going to take time to implement take a while. if you can't even get the bear, mm -hmm. bear resistant. I don't want to say bear proof because there's some bears that are awfully clever. Um, and so they yeah. can sometimes get into these, but bear resistant <laughs> trash cans. So uh, yeah, careful thought on how to do this, you know, is important. I would definitely start take a look at um, communities that face the same issues we do. You know, Whistler, Wyoming, another ski community, faces tremendous problems with bears and uh, bear resistant trash and all these things. And, and they really were a pioneer in this in the same way that Tahoe also historically has had problems with this. And those, both of those cases, more black bears than grizzlies, but some of the lessons they've learned certainly are things that we as a small mountain town, just like them for could sure. take advantage of. So hopefully soon, thanks for the local politics update. Um, for these of you guys who are living really, really far away, by the way, where's everybody uh, from Kelsey? Who's the furthest away tonight on the broadcast based on where people told us, they were fun. I want to know who's watching from furthest away. Hopefully we'll have like a really exotic one who's like bear proof trash exciting. cans. exciting. They're like, what is, we don't even have bears. Yeah. <laughs> like, why are you guys so worried about this? Um, the best way to think about it, bears are omnivores, right? Just like yeah. we are. They love the same food we love for the same reason. So they'll eat anything pretty much. And once they get addicted to human food, they stick around. So it's definitely. It's a big issue. Um, I grew up in Southern Colorado. I've talked about the women a little bit. One town that went through a similar struggle, just like Jackson went through, is going through, is Durango, Colorado. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They have black bears. And so black bears, of course, are not as aggressive um, as grizzlies. Uh, but it is a big issue when you have bears of any species just wandering through downtown Durango, downtown yeah. Jackson, knocking over trash cans. And it took a while for Durango um, to get people to have bear-proof trash cans. It took like a decade. And a lot of that is just educating people and getting people to understand that it is in their best interest to have bear-proof trash cans. And so it might be a while before that comes to Jackson, but I think we are moving in the right direction. Um, as a kid, um, we had bears walking right up onto our porch yeah. and um, getting into our trash. And as soon as we got a bear-proof trash can, it changed it right away. Um, there's this crazy story of a bear getting into my trash can and my dad running out in his PJs and spraying it with bear spray. Oh, wow. And then the wind blowing the bear spray into our house. <laughs> and we had to evacuate for like oh, three no. days. It oh, was, no. It was awful. My mom was standing in the bathtub looking out, looking out the window as the bear ran away, as my dad blew the bear spray and she got blasted. The wind blew it right into her face and she was sneezing and coughing for like five days. Like, oh, wow. It was, it was awful. Um, those types of interactions hopefully will be avoided yeah. in the future in Jackson and in other Western states, you know, with those bear proof trash cans. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, so if you live in a mountain town with bears, consider it. I know that they're kind of hard to come by currently, but it's definitely worth it. In my opinion. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Don, good question. Does someone live in the Miller house year round on Ooh, the Elk Refuge? Good question. Um, Don, that's a great question. So for those of you guys, once again, who haven't had a chance to go mm -hmm. to the National Elk Refuge, there is a National Historic Site called the Miller House um, where Mr. and Mrs. Robert Miller lived. Um, and they uh, voluntarily vacated their home uh, so that there would be more land available for the elk. And mm -hmm. it's a big, important part of the... National Elk Refuge's history. Um, historically, yes, we have had National Elk Refuge employees living in the Miller House. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, they received a federal grant to try and restore the Miller House into the condition it was like 
uh, during the homesteading era. So you can actually go in there on, in tours in the summertime and you can actually yeah. see, um, <laughs> it's really neat. You know, you can see the old wallpaper. It's been restored. You can see the original um, homesteading um, so cool. title, I guess is the term for it, <laughs> certificate. I'm not sure. It's really, really neat. But it does mean that it's a little harder for people to live in there in the winter. So we mm-hmm. have often on had uh, Elk Refuge employees living there. But since it's restoration, I don't believe, I could be wrong, but I don't believe there's one there I don't now. think there's been anyone in there since COVID. Oh, that's yeah. true. Yeah, and, and you know, they used to give tours of it. They're not giving any tours. You're not even allowed yeah. to like park at it um, because of COVID and because it is closed and everything. Yeah. But great question. Mm-hmm. Thanks very much for that one. Let's see here. You guys are giving us some good stumpers. I'm really loving it. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Caitlin, absolutely love the photo behind you guys. Oh, anybody, yeah. Anybody know <laughs> what that is? Huh? Guess in the comments. <laughs> um, so the way that photo got on my wall, I actually did take that photo um, mm-hmm. with full permission of the Park Service from a helicopter. Uh, yeah. That is Grand Prismatic. That's the second largest hot spring in the world. It's up in Yellowstone National Park. Um, and it hangs in my house. That's where we're broadcasting, by the way, right now from my house <laughs> because it was sitting in a gallery space um, for sale and someone leaned their skis up against it. And they scratched it. It's really, oh, no. really hard to see oh, where gosh. the scratch is. It's kind of hard to tell. But after that, of course, it couldn't be sold. So I was really, really happy because it meant I got to keep it in my own house. Such a cool photo. I don't really own very much of my work, but I do own that one. So we figure it's definitely a good backdrop for our Wildlife Wednesday program. So thanks for that. That's really fun you noticed. But if you ever get the chance to see Grand Prismatic in Yellowstone, it is amazing. Every it's color insane. of the rainbow. Yeah. It's beautiful. My favorite geyser is there too. Yeah. Excelsior Geyser, oh, which so is cool. terrifying. And I hope that at some point in my life, I get to see it. Yeah. If I'm like 80 years old and I hear news that it's going to go up, I'm flying to Yellowstone <laughs> to see it. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Let's see here. I think we got time for just a couple more questions. Oh, Mark, this is an interesting one. Tyler, you want this one? Yeah. How close do wildlife like wolves, bears, and bison get to public lodges? Ooh, have there been any issues in the past? Yes. (laughs) To lodges within Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park. Absolutely. There's stories of um, certain grizzlies coming through Jackson Lodge and getting into the trash there. Um, People waking up and there being a grizzly bear on or on the lawn in front of their cabin um at old faithful on tours old faithful lodge we often run into bison there Mm -hmm. and so absolutely is an issue that occasion that happens and so the park has really strict regulations they have wild or wildlife proof uh, trash cans and oftentimes they have you know some sort of barrier to keep animals out and most of the time animals are not going to go into these areas unless there's something that draws them there or unless they're migrating. And so oftentimes when we see animals like foxes or bears in these kind of public areas where there's lots of people, it's oftentimes because they're getting fed. So so, um, kind of going back to like our past question, we have had issues, especially with foxes recently in Grand Teton National Park who do get fed by tourists and then hang out in areas where there are lodges or public parking, especially when... Uh, there's not a lot of food around. So at this time of year in the winter, a lot of animals are struggling to find food resources. And so they'll show up looking for handouts. In the middle of the summer, in August, bears that don't migrate up into the mountains to find food will often be seen in and around towns and lodges and picnic grounds. Um, And then, of course, another really good example of wildlife being close are elk up in Mammoth. And so if you are in Yellowstone and you happen to go to Mammoth, be super careful about the elk. Drive through Mammoth very slowly because the elk are drawn there because there's irrigated grass. Yeah. It's like a perfect like spread buffet for the elk to feed on. And they will spend the entire year in Mammoth. Yeah. It's uh, particularly a problem during the rut when those big bull elk come and um, are searching for those females. They'll actually be rutting in the town of Mammoth. Yeah. And that causes a lot of issues. Oftentimes you'll see tourist cars driving by with um, holes in them because they drive too close to the elk, the bull elk in particular, and then the bull elk will actually attack the vehicles. And this, you know, this this continues to be an issue. I think it's gotten a lot better since, you know, we've been educating the public about not feeding wildlife and having bear-proof trash cans. But it's definitely something that has been an issue in the past and we're continually 
kind of facing at this point. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. It, the thing to remember about wildlife feeding too is before I used to get very uptight and be like, God, people are yeah. just idiots and jerks. If you don't know any better, yeah. you think you're helping them. You don't necessarily mm-hmm. always have... Um, it's important to remember not everybody comes from a background of understanding that that might not be in the best interest of the wildlife to be feeding them. They think they're being helpful. And so. you know, like we grew up with Bambi and we're like, oh, the cute little forest animals. I mean, yeah. of course you want to feed them. They're, they're oftentimes adorable. The foxes that hang out around some of the lodges are really, really cute. A lot of people like to photograph them. And, and so I get where people are coming from. And that's why education and educating people when they come and visit parks or just natural areas in general is so important. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I recently learned that feeding animals in national parks in certain Asian countries is encouraged. Yeah. Um, and it's part of the park policy yeah. that you should be doing that. So if you're coming, mm-hmm. for instance, from um, a background of either you've never visited a national park and you just want to help the animals out, or you're mm-hmm. coming from a culture or a tradition where that's the norm, um, mm-hmm. how are you going to know any better? So there's lots of signage yeah. uh, now that tells you. Guys, I was just thinking about Grand Prismatic. <laughs> I should mention it is on the web store. So if you really want one, oh, it is. Yeah. you could get one. <laughs> I don't know if we have one quite that big on the web store, but if you want one that size, we could probably arrange it. Definitely help with our guide benefits for sure. Have you heard of the Rabbit Island in Japan? Yes. Yeah. 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 Tell, tell them about yes, it. It's really so cool. There's this island and it's like a little resort in Japan that you can boat or fly to. Yeah. And they have their domestic rabbits. So they're all in different colors, but you just go there and it's like a rabbit village almost. They have like little houses for rabbits. You go there and you feed them and the place is just overrun essentially with rabbits. And so that's a good example of a park where people would go and feed wildlife. You know, for someone who doesn't know what a wild rabbit looks like, a wild rabbit might look very similar to a domesticated rabbit. And um, there's also a really famous deer park in Japan where they go and feed Sika deer, which is a species we don't have here. They're really closely related to elk, a little bit smaller. And they look exactly i mean really really close to like a mule deer or a white tail deer that we have here and so i i get how people when they visit they see these animals they're like oh it's just like the deer it's just like the rabbits yeah back home yeah you know whatever your experience is and then if you don't if you aren't getting that education not to feed the animals then yeah like, what are you gonna do what are you right? gonna do like you just don't know so guys i do have one more challenge for you guys since we're just about done um, Kelsey let us know that she thinks that Alton from Maryland is the furthest away this evening. Ooh. Alton, thank you so much for tuning in all the way from Maryland. I'm originally from Maryland, so yeah. go Terps, go Maryland. I did get some interesting news out of just outside Maryland, Washington, D.C. today, which is, of course, that their team, the football team, the Washington team has a new name. They are now the Washington Commanders. I'm going to inflict my opinion on y'all again. Oh, boy. Terrible name. <laughs> Terrible name. So they wanted to keep the same color scheme, which was uh, red and brown and gold. And so I was trying to come up today with animals that they could have named that NFL team after that are red and brown Brown and gold. Red, 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 it's like crimson, gold, not really red. It's more like crimson and gold and brown. So the first thing that came to mind, of course, was a coyote, the Washington Coyotes. But I think there's another sports team... That's know. a coyote. I think that one might be taken. So then there was some talk about the red tails. And of course, red tail hawks are... That'd be really cool. That color scheme, right? I immediately right? started thinking about birds. You guys know me. I, I, I am a huge bird. Nerd. Right? I, I do know that there, <laughs> the thought there was also an African-American, all black, um, World War II ace squadron called the red tails that oh, they cool. were also going to name them in honor of. Somebody said the red wolves, which of course would be that color scheme. That'd be really scheme. cool. That'd be if really If you cool. can come up with a better name for an NFL team uh, that is an animal that is <laughs> crimson and brown uh, and gold, tell us in the comment section because I bet you amongst all of us that we are... can find a better one. Still here at the then tail end. we should end. petition. Yeah, we should petition for a different name. And bonus points if it lives on the eastern seaboard. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think the Washington polar bears would be like a big hit, no. for instance. <laughs> um, but I do know that we're, we're running out of time, guys. So I do want you guys comment in the comment section if you can come up with a better one. Uh, in like 30 seconds, I came up with a couple. But I bet you, you guys, as a group, all of us are smarter than some of us, right? So you guys can come up with some good ones. There's your little challenge Sweet. for sure. <laughs> guys, it has been such a pleasure spending this Wednesday with you. We miss uh, not having to do this. You know, we used to do it every week and it was just too much. Um, but I do miss it. It's, it's hard waiting for a whole nother month. I know. And this is my favorite part, like talking about things yeah. and like having a discussion. That's yeah. the best part of this, in for my sure. opinion. 
So, uh. <laughs> yeah, have a fantastic month, um, a wild month. We hope to see you guys next month, 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always our pleasure. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you guys so much.